So uh, now I will introduce our first speaker of the next session. So I'm pleased to introduce Darren, who's going to be talking to us about going from prototype to production at Pion. So thank you very much, Darren. Okay, can we, is this working? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, my name is Darren. I'm an engineering manager at Pion. We're a small company. So that means actually I do way more than the title implies. And uh, I, want, I use Racket all the time at work, but I wanted to talk about a specific instance where we developed an instrument. Now, when you work for a small company driven for profit and you want to sell an instrument, it means you have no time. Because the sales guys have already located customers, so everything is pedal to the metal. And I wanted to point out how much Racket really helped. So first, a little bit about me as far as a programming background goes. Largely self-taught, I've used uh, quite a few programming languages, especially we used uh, Zilog multi, uh, uh, microcontrollers, so some assembly in C there when we design our own boards. But when the project starts getting larger, the time it takes to develop very low-level hardware and the code associated with it really does go up quite a bit. So when I had a short time to develop a, long instrument, a large instrument, the first thing is get as high level as fast as possible. The faster I can get to racket, the faster I'm done, basically. The way I look at it there. So what does our company do? <laughs> what does our company do? Our company uh, develops instrumentations for pharmaceutical companies to do drug research. That means you take a pill. What happens? Okay? We want to answer how much of a drug is dissolved. You took a pill, say uh, it's a 100 milligram pill, only half of it ever dissolves. Of that half, only another half maybe is ionized, which means uh, it's only the neutral species that can cross the membrane. And of the half of the half that is unionized, it takes time to trans uh, to go from your intestines into your bloodstream. So you may still lose even more of it yet. So our instruments, by and large, answer these questions. And here is the one, one of them in particular. Now, I apologize, this is not a glamour shot. I simply took a big old piece of white cardboard and put it behind our lab instrument. <laughs> so this is in practice, literally, what it looks like here. And we have uh, a large dispensing body and uh, sort of a measurement head and then an auto sampler to select multiple samples. Oops. And here's the dispensing. We have a strong acid, a strong base, a salty water, and possibly some kind of co-solvent like uh, methanol is very common. The measurement head here contains a pH electrode, very important. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on the digestive system slide, but the pH throughout your intestinal tract, your whole digestive system changes. So it's definitely important to keep track of pH. Uh, we do do UV analysis, so there's a fiber optic probe here and a stir to keep everything moving and a temperature probe for temperature control. And then there's just an auto sampler here. Now it, is, it has about uh, 16 positions here, but only eight of them are used for measurement. The rest are for washes and buffer calibrations and so on and so forth. So again, my goal was, as I stated early on, I didn't have a lot of time. I needed to get as high level as fast as possible. That means getting some kind of Linux ready CPU. And here I have uh, the single board computer that I found. What was very helpful about this, first of all, it can boot directly into BusyBox, but otherwise you can go into uh, Debian for, um, for development. That's a lot easier because you have full access to terminals and so on and so forth. But the key feature of this is it has, it's actually on the other side of the board, but it has an FPGA on it, which means that a lot of the hardware communication that needs to be a little more low level can be taken care of right away in the FPGA. So you have to spend even less time trying to write DLLs, for example, which then you use the foreign function interface and try and lift into Racket for. So a lot of this can be done right on the FPGA. Very helpful, really boosted development time. So you, you get the trade off of time for money. This is more expensive than if we had designed something custom for ourselves, but it would have taken time that we didn't have. So this is the choices you have to make. So the boot sequence is roughly that the BusyBox OS loads. This only takes less than three seconds. 
And during that time, it loads the FPGA, soft loads the FPGA with whatever custom code you have. And then it launches Racket. <clears throat> but that takes, uh, so then the Racket does the last configuration, but as you know, Racket startup time is a little slow. So the total time is about 20 seconds from power on. So the Racket takes about, yeah, about 15 to 17 seconds to get up and running, which is a little bit unfortunate, but that's what we have. So how does the main program run to control all these devices? It's fairly straightforward. We have the PC send something to the main loop, which parses it and looks it up the devices that the command is intended for in some device table, which may send it either to real devices if they're connected or software debug devices if that's the mode we're operating in. Those devices then send a response back to the main loop, which then sends it back to the host PC, Windows PC, for example, that's controlling it. That's the full thing. It's not very complicated. Here's an example of a command that we have. So the PC would say something like, uh, hey, tell me all the devices that are connected. So you powered it on. It discovered a bunch of devices. Which ones do you actually have? And first it acknowledges um, zero means, in this case, that's a valid device and a valid command. I understand. No problem. And then later it comes back with a list of all the devices. So we do have automatic device discovery. That helps, of course, uh, if something's going wrong with one of the devices. You'll notice right away because it's not appearing in this list. Another example would be to tell the dispenser to pick up uh, some volume of liquid from a certain port. And again, we get an acknowledge of some sort that says, yes, I know uh, this device exists. This command seems to be formatted properly, etc." And then later, sometime later, after the device has done its job, it responds with this thing. Now, this whole system has to be asynchronous because all these things take quite a bit of time. So if we're trying to, to precision dispense very small amounts of liquid, these numbers are, this uh, one million would be one milliliter. It's, the units are nanoliters. To precision dispense something, not only does the motor have to turn a very small amount, but you actually have a very, very thin capillary to dispense the liquid. So even dispensing a small amount of liquid, what we would think would be small, you know, like 100 uh, microliters or something, can take quite a bit of time. Otherwise, you have too much back pressure in the system and you blow all the liquids out. So in some sense, none of these are real-time operations, which is what makes it very easy to get into a high-level, quote-unquote, scripting language right away. So that's a rough overview of what we did. And now I just wanted to, to indicate what I found most helpful about Racket versus basically anything else I've ever used to do this kind of work. And the um, first thing I, actually, before I get to the helpful part, my apologies, I did want to say what was difficult about it. Uh, the difficult part was that Racket doesn't actually offer any sort of solutions over any other language in terms of the main development cycle on an embedded system. If you're not working directly on the system over a terminal, then you're still you have one machine in which you write your code, and then you transfer it, you do some compilation, and then you, then you can test it. Nothing in particular helps with that in Racket, unless you write your own infrastructure behind it for testing. Um, startup time is significant. And if I had to do this over, I might try and write some of the initial PC communication code in C so that the instrument fakes it. It appears that it's ready before it's actually ready so that we could get the startup time of like three to five seconds under normal. And uh, there's still some duplication of efforts. So when we're doing, uh, when we're communicating with other companies' devices, they often just use like byte strings and so on. So when I'm writing my code, I sort of end up duplicating some string functions in Racket to work with bytes instead. Those don't always work directly. So what really helped? Um, yeah, major opinion warning. I love, I love that it's dynamically typed at the core. I don't have anything against typed languages at all. I, I know several of them, and I do use them. But when you go to test a program, the typed portion, uh, using a typed language, creates the entire program dependency, or at least what you're testing, a whole module or whatever. And you may not be testing that. 
you may only be wanting to test a chunk. So when you hit run, or you type run, or you load the program, you know what you're intending to test, and the type system doesn't. So to me, I, I just, I really like that aspect of a dynamically typed language where you don't inject this whole code dependency every time you hit run. And when you're exploring other people's hardware, it's actually kind of important because though they create documentation for you, chances that that documentation is actually correct, 100% correct, and that doesn't have its own little quirks is very small. So you do end up doing quite a bit of debugging with hardware, and I find that that really helps. So you get, if you start typing everything, you get a sort of death by a thousand cuts scenario because you need the whole program to be correct before you can test this little piece of it and so on and so forth. And I find it very hard to do this speedily. Maybe it's my own fault, but I found it a major strength. Uh, the next strength is like nearly everything is first class in Racket. And that means, means good and bad. I mean, but what it does mean mostly to me is that uh, what first comes to your mind to, to handle some problem is most likely to work correctly. It's, you can throw around classes and functions and so on and so forth. The very first thing that comes to your mind on how you would do this, you don't have to then undo your thoughts to, to match it to whatever language you're writing. Like Racket already has most of these structures available for you. And I found that to be extremely helpful. Same, same thing with what I would call plain old data in Racket. Anything where write and read work together. And Racket has a ton of these in terms of, of course, regular cons structures like lists, prefab structures, and so on and so forth. That's super helpful. If you're using these kind of structures, you can save data and read it right back again if you need to. You can print F it or you know, have it, things evaluate to that, and you can read it basically by your eye directly, especially in the case of uh, prefab structures. It's very transparent what you're intending to do. Having this available out, the, out, the, out of the gate really makes things very fast, in my opinion. And also, I think custom syntax. Now, I put this hearty quote up here to illustrate my opinion on what some people would call uh, syntactic sugar. I don't really look at half of my syntax is syntactic sugar in the sense that I'm trying to write a procedure, but it can't be a procedure because it can't, the evaluation rules have to be slightly different. And you get to delay a lot of decisions that way with syntax. Now, it may be a quote unquote bad use of syntax, it may be somewhat against some wishes, but I found it to be extremely conceptually simple. And I just wanna give a few examples. They're not amazing. Um, but my first one would be something like every, dev every device responds most of the time with a standard response. This cannot be a procedure because the standard response of the body doesn't get evaluated. It first needs to propagate this up to the main loop so that the main loop can respond with this acknowledge zero so that the PC says, all right, I know it's working. Then it's allowed to work on the body. I could, of course, simply wrap that up in a thunk, but that's a decision that I ended up making later in the development. Earlier in the development, the body was handled in different ways. So already most of the code, if it was written in this way, worked. And I only had to change the underlying implementation of the syntax to settle on a model. But that means it reads like it is. And another thing I'd like to point out is it also means that uh, not all responses are standard. Some devices don't have standard responses. We have one, for example, repeat the last response. We would get in some kind of crazy loop where you make a repeat last response request and now your last response was repeat last response and you don't want that. So there are non-standard ones. So you want to name it already. You want to name it just like you would any other function. But again, it can't be a function. So I did cover that and same thing with uh, body. I have another one, for example, where I just define the protocol for some of the classes. So most of the um, uh, devices are mapped to racket classes. You want to define an interface for these, and you want to define, say, the bit strings that rep uh, the byte strings that represent them. You can do that in the same place when you use define syntax because you can use a begin and then have several defines. So everything becomes very clear when 
Uh, you probably can't see that very well, I'm not sure, but these are all the kinds of commands that everything can respond to, and these are how you would call them as a byte string. So you just get to couple that definition right there instead of having this sort of strung out in some weird way in the code. And it only takes a defined syntax rule of like, what, four lines to, to separate that out. Now, again, this is, this is a syntactic sugar kind of situation. But it's so helpful when you go back six months later to look, to look at something like this. Another thing is the copying pasting is avoided like crazy. Because I'm sort of modeling everything as classes and I have specific kind of public functions I want to declare, basically for a lot of the standard functions I just have this one defined. It, it takes care of the inner structure and everything else of the class and then I just get this declared in one place and it's done. And I don't have to copy and paste, change it one place. But you can't do that with a, with a function. You can only do that with syntax. So I mostly think of syntactic sugar as, I'd love this to be a function but, and so that helps a lot. Finally, this, this is actually my last one here. I may have gone over just a touch, I apologize. But this saved my life. If, if, <laughs> if we're debugging Windows, how do we manage this? If we're in Linux, how do we handle this? So we're, you know, most, we're a company, we use Windows mostly, and when I'm running it on my PC, so I did end up creating the infrastructure I discussed earlier. I don't know where else you could do this. I mean, maybe I'm just ignorant and that's my fault, but this was so easy to write in Racket, it was ridiculous. If we're Windows debugging, then some file system exists like uh, dev null, and if we're not, I mean, if we're Linux debugging, then dev null exists and not, and then you get to branch off a few things like some of your command protocols to paste, uh, based on whether or not you're in Windows or not. And this is so helpful, it's, it's unbelievable. So it allows true cross-platform development if you've put just a little bit of effort into having this, this conditional branch. So that's it. I want to thank everyone a lot for Racket. It's super helpful, and that was it. All right, so the question was, what were the protocols for dealing with the actual physical devices? And those were extremely varied. I did mostly skip over that slide because I was really tight on time. But we have uh, some basic digital input output. And I did end up writing a DLL for hardware communication for like single bit hardware. And then uh, that got lifted into the FFI. Other ones were a lot of serial communication. So a lot of devices are serial port of some sort. And that was built into the FPGA. So I got to leverage that directly, and the manufacturer of that computer actually maps their FP, I mean their serial ports to um, TCP IP ports. So all I didn't all I had to use was open a port and start sending strings down it. Also, so the stir, for example, needed was a motor control. So that again needed some kind of pulse width modulation to use. So that was also through uh, the foreign, the FFI. Does the GC ever get into your web? So it did not. Um, it, repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Did the, uh, the question was whether the garbage collector ever got in the way. It did not. And that's because, again, none of these, none of these devices are real time devices, so to speak. So the time spent garbage collecting, you would never notice anyway because, for example, the dispenser is sitting there taking 30 seconds to make a move because it's going so slowly. So that enabled us to very easily not worry about garbage collection at all. <laughs>